Here at Mythology and Gaming, I make sure to read everyone's comments, whether good or bad, because you took the time out to engage with something that stuck with you. And about two weeks ago, I posted on the community page asking what your hot takes are within the world of mythology. So I want to take some time to talk about those and discuss them further. To start us off, we've got Frederick Davidson 7037, who says, I enjoy that most sources that exist of Norse mythology is post-Christianization, as it lets us determine what was original and what has been added later. So if you're not aware of it, much of Norse mythology that we know today is because of Christianity between the 10th and 13th centuries. This was because many Christian or Catholic missionaries, priests, and so on were moving their worship and themselves further north from Rome to help or really convert more people from the polytheistic and pagan worship. We know more about the Old Norse stories and the folklore of the northern people of Europe because of the medieval texts written during this time, the two main sources being the Prose and Poetic Edda, which come from this time period, being written by the Icelandic poet and historian Snorri Sturluson. This hot take I'm actually a fan of. I wouldn't necessarily call it one, but seeing that we'd have a completely different understanding of the Norse myths without the Christianization is an interesting thought. So thank you for that one. Next up, we have BCS815, who says, Studying the Yamnaya culture will broadly recontextualize our understanding of Western mythology. So this one's rather interesting because I honestly had never even heard of this before reading this comment. To explain, the Yamnaya people existed sometime between 3300 BCE and 2600 BCE, and were predominantly located in an area just north of the Black Sea, in what we now call Ukraine, Georgia, and some of Russia. As a nomadic people, the Yamnaya focused exclusively on hunting and gathering everything that they needed. What some archaeologists have found is that these early Bronze Age people were surprisingly religious, as they would actually bury their dead in ceremonial mounds known as kurgans, and many of the celebrated dead would be covered in a substance known as ochre, which was just an iron-rich clay, while being buried with metal objects specific to that person. These rituals for burying the dead are somewhat similar to the burials of the dead we see in Egypt during the same time period, as the Yamnaya people would reserve this type of burial for specific individuals or those with a lot of power. As well, they would actually commit animal sacrifices to their gods or whatever they believed in as a higher authority. Now, what's really interesting, and what I think BCS 815 is getting at, is the fact that these people migrated everywhere, north, south, east, west, all of it, meaning that they migrated into a Bronze Age Greece when they traveled west, and being a culture that mixed metallurgy and religious thought, they may have potentially influenced or outright been the cause of Greece's creation of some gods like Hephaestus, the god of metallurgy. What you're seeing now is a very interesting map that shows when it's believed these people moved throughout Europe and Asia showing just how much these people moved as time went on. So thank you. Thank you very much for that one. Before we continue, I just wanted to let you all know that I've started a Patreon. By signing up, you can directly support the channel as 2024 has been a very crazy year, not only for me, but for everyone. And I don't expect the craziness to stop. So I have two tiers on here that you can join if you want to, Gamer and Historian. I've put a link in the description if you're interested, and as well, if you have any other hot takes or any other thoughts on what we're covering here, please let me know down in the comments. Next up, we have Mart3151 who posted a two-part, saying first, I hate how the myth of Medusa is seen now thanks to feminism, since it was never meant to be a feminist story. And two, I understand that what Hades did to Persephone was wrong, but I still think it's the most healthy relationship in the entirety of Greek mythology. So. Let's tackle this first one. And I need to say this 100%. No matter which version of a myth you read or hear, whether it's Medusa or any other myth, that version that you hear is technically a correct version, as tales and stories evolve and change over time due to several different contexts, like who's telling the story and where the story is being told or written. With that said, the most commonly accepted story of Medusa is where Medusa is seduced by Poseidon in the Temple of Athena. 
Being a temple of Vestal virgins, and an extremely sacred one at that, Athena punished Medusa by cursing her with snakes for hair and a gaze that would turn anyone to solid stone. In all honesty, this myth and its origins could actually have a video in itself entirely. Now, for the modern view of the story, and what I think Mart is getting at, is that the feminist view changes the context of the story, from a view of Medusa being punished to her gaining new strength, as she could now turn men into stone just by looking at them. The gazes that men would have for her would now become their weakness. This would help her fight against her male oppressors, and is believed to ultimately empower her more so than punish her. What's really interesting with this, however, is that this isn't actually that modern, as the thought of Medusa warding off any advances was actually a fairly common thought in ancient Greece. This was because Medusa is a Gorgon, a monster who has been with the Greeks since the 5th millennium BCE during its very primal inception, as Gorgons were seen as wards or protective images against other evils in the world. This is why, when we see the images of Gorgons, they are always facing the viewer, instead of facing to the side like the rest of the images in Greece. Now, for the second part, this story has actually grown in popularity over time. The most common story depicts Persephone, the goddess of spring, tending to the fields and flowers. At the same time, Hades, the god of the underworld, saw her and instantly fell for her. Hades sought out Zeus and expressed his desire to make Persephone his bride, and just as quickly as Zeus had agreed to Hades' claim for his new bride, Persephone was brought down into the underworld. Demeter, Persephone's mother and goddess of agriculture, searched frantically for Persephone, foregoing her duties and letting plant life die and wilt away. When Demeter learned of her daughter's whereabouts, she demanded that her brother Hades return her at once. Hades agreed to let Persephone go, but only after she had stayed as his queen for four more months, as Persephone had eaten pomegranate seeds that Hades had given her. After her allotted time in the underworld, Persephone would return to the world above and to her mother, bringing about a renewal of plant life and warm seasons. This story projects the images and the changes of the seasons, and is actually one of the only myths that actively includes Hades within it. In ancient Greece, Hades was worshipped only by a few groups within the city-states, as he was viewed as a very neutral standing god. He was never boastful or overjoyous, as well he was never brutal or unfair. He was just a god, who took his role as ruler of the underworld with the utmost respect and with a lot of seriousness. For many ancient Greeks, they didn't want to invoke his arrival, his potential wrath, or even his quiet judgment, for fear of leaving the mortal realm to join him in the underworld. This sort of sentiment is the basis for what we see today, with Hades being seen as the most decent among the gods of Greek myth. His relationship may actually reflect this fairness that was seen at the point of death for every mortal in ancient Greece. Hades could have easily given Persephone more pomegranate seeds than the myth suggests, forcing her to stay in the underworld as his queen forever. Instead, he agrees with Demeter, only taking Persephone for half the year and then returning her to the mortal realm, bringing new life to the world. Even still is the fact that he makes her a queen, instead of an object to be shown off or to be had in the way that Zeus and Poseidon consistently did. Of course, this goes without saying, Hades still kidnapped the young goddess and forced her to stay in his kingdom, which is very wrong. Just want to say that. But lastly, we have Alex Tier 8813 who says, Zeus isn't cool. Yeah, I got nothing to say. Good, yeah. <laughs>